On a warm summer's day, a crowd of thousands gathered around in Tower Hill, the traditional place for executions. What they were waiting to see was the execution of a man who had affected their lives in so many ways for the past 10 years. Soon enough, this man stepped forward onto the scaffold wearing his fine robes. He was made to kneel down and place his head and his neck on a wooden block. Some prayers were said and within moments, a masked, anonymous axe man brought a heavy axe blade down onto his neck. The crowd gasped. What they had just witnessed was the execution of Thomas Cromwell, one of Henry VIII's chief ministers who had enjoyed incredible power for the best part of a decade. So the question is, what was it that brought a man with such power and such reputation to the scaffold on Tower Hill to have his head removed in 1514? Well, there's five key factors that led to the downfall of Thomas Cromwell, and this video is going to help you to understand each one of them. That way, you'll be able to answer any question on the downfall of Thomas Cromwell. So let's start off with how we understand the reasons why Thomas Cromwell was executed. There's a simple way to do it. The simplest way to remember is with a mnemonic, and we're going to use Creek. The first reason being the Cleves marriage. The second reason for Cromwell's downfall being religion. The third key reason that Cromwell lost his head were his enemies. Of course, added into this is his ambition. And finally, the personality of the king himself. C-R-E-A-K, Creek. This is the easiest way to remember the downfall of Thomas Cromwell. So let's start with the first one, the Cleves marriage. What was it about this that eventually led to Thomas Cromwell's execution? The marriage to Anne of Cleves was one of the key reasons why Thomas Cromwell fell from power in 1540, because he had been the mastermind behind this marriage. So back in October 1537, Jane Seymour, the king's wife, had passed away shortly after giving birth. This meant that the grief-stricken Henry was busy looking for a new wife in the years that followed. Unfortunately for Henry, because of the religious changes in England and because of the messy breakup with Catherine of Aragon, he didn't have many friends in Catholic Europe. On top of this, to really compound his problems, in 1539, Francis I, the King of France, and Charles V, the King of Spain or the Holy Roman Empire, had signed the Treaty of Toledo, uh, cementing the two in an alliance. This left England completely isolated in Europe. England really didn't have very many friends, and Henry didn't have many princesses that he could call on for a marriage. But what he did have as an option was Anne of Cleves, coming from the Principality of Cleves. She was an option because Cleves, the Principality, was Protestant. It had also broken away from the Catholic Church, just like England. The trouble is, Henry had never actually met Anne of Cleves, so he was perhaps banking on a marriage with a woman that he'd never seen. This is where Cromwell comes in. He convinced the king that this was the best option, and to Cromwell it seemed like that was the case. Eventually, a painter, Hans Holbein the Younger, was dispatched to Cleves to paint a likeness of Anne of Cleves and to bring it back and show Henry. When he saw the painting, he was very impressed and he agreed to marry the young woman that he saw. Unfortunately, the painter had done a bit of a flattering job on Anne of Cleves, so when she finally arrived in England, Henry exclaimed that I like her not, I like her not, and he quickly exited uh, from his from his ministers. He didn't like Anne of Cleves in the flesh and he was very unhappy. He desperately tried to get Cromwell to cancel the marriage so that he didn't have to go through with it. But Cromwell knew that by the time the treaties were signed and the deal was done, it was too late. He couldn't go back on the arrangement to marry Anne of Cleves. So on the 6th of January, 1540, Henry and Anne of Cleves was, were married. Henry was none too pleased and you can only imagine what he must have looked like as he was giving his vows at the wedding service. He really didn't want to be there. Unfortunately for Thomas Cromwell, this may have helped him in the short term and he didn't necessarily face any repercussions straight away, but in the long term. So the second reason why Thomas Cromwell fell from power is the influence of religion and religious changes. Thomas Cromwell, of course, was the man responsible for the dissolution of the monasteries and the eventual process of the Reformation in England, turning England into a Protestant country. Unfortunately, Henry VIII, was very lukewarm about some of the changes that were being brought in by Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell was considered to be a Protestant and many people in the court knew that he was probably a Protestant through and through. However, King Henry VIII was not. Throughout his life he had been a devout Catholic and as a young man he'd even written books on Catholicism. He'd been entitled Defender of the Faith by the Pope and throughout his life he never really gave up on the old religion. It had always been an important part of his life. 
So when Cromwell was trying to push through religious change, he was happy to go along with it at first because he knew that this would secure him a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So he was happy to go through with the whole dissolution of the monasteries and setting up the Church of England. And Cromwell had used this to push through more Protestant reforms. But Henry had never really taken to that as fully as, he, as Cromwell perhaps thought. Add on to this the influence of the nobility. The nobility, especially in the north of England but elsewhere, were themselves also staunchly Catholic, lots of them. They had lots of power and lots of influence, and because of their hatred of Thomas Cromwell and their hatred of his religious reforms, they put pressure on King Henry VIII to view him differently and to make an enemy of Thomas Cromwell in the courts. So the influence of the nobility uh, in religious terms was very strong. Add on top of this something that you've also already seen a video about on the channel, that is the pilgrimage of grace. The religious changes that Thomas Cromwell was enforcing on, on England were enormous. Shutting down monasteries that had been a central part of village, town and parish life uh, for centuries really deeply affected people from the nobility to the middle classes right the way down to the peasant classes. It affected everybody in every walk of life. In the north of England, people weren't taking it lying down and thousands of people in various different protests around the north of England uh, joined together to protest about it. This became known as the Pilgrimage of Grace, a giant uprising of ordinary people as well as the middle class and the nobility against Thomas Cromwell and his religious reforms. This was a big issue because it made the king look weak, it caused instability in England, it meant that the king had to crush an uprising against people who had the same faith as him and it really put the king in a difficult position. So the Pilgrimage of Grace was one of those other reasons, a religious reason, that pushed Henry VIII further away from Thomas Cromwell. He wasn't happy necessarily about the changes to the church, and he was less happy that he had to deal with a mass uprising of 60,000 people against these religious changes. Add on to this the fact that many of the nobility, and it also had the ear of the king and had a certain influence within the courts. For instance, Lord Darcy, he was one of the chief uh, protesters during the Pilgrimage of Grace, he said to Thomas Cromwell to his face that he had no time for these religious changes and that eventually they would catch up for, with Cromwell and he would lose his head. Uh, on top of this, the Duke of Norfolk, that age-old enemy of Wolsey and Cromwell, he was still there and he hated these changes too, as well as the Duke of Suffolk and others in the ruling classes who had Henry's ear and had influence over the king. So these religious changes were really unifying people against Thomas Cromwell and they're one of the key reasons why he fell from power. Well, this links us on to the third factor, Cromwell's enemies. And it's nice and simple because his biggest enemy in the court is the Duke of Norfolk. In April 1539, Thomas Cromwell fell ill with a terrible fever and he was so ill that he couldn't attend the opening of Parliament. But this was a great opportunity for the Duke of Norfolk and other conservative members of the Houses of Parliament. They knew that with Cromwell out of the picture, not in Parliament, they could push through laws to change some of those religious reforms that had been happening, to roll them back, bring them back in. So Duke of Norfolk jumped on this opportunity and he introduced to the Houses of Parliament the Act of Six Articles. The Act of Six Articles basically brought back some of the old Catholic parts of faith and religion that Thomas Cromwell had gotten rid of before. This was a serious dent to Cromwell's pride and it showed to people within the court, within Parliament and within the country at large that Cromwell was losing his grip on power and that his enemies, the Duke of Norfolk and so on, were getting one over on him. What's more, the king himself was also inclined to uh, agree with the Duke of Norfolk. He had always been uneasy about these religious reforms and when he realised that the Duke of Norfolk was rolling them back, he kind of sided with the Duke of Norfolk on the issue. So Cromwell was losing the king's favour here while he was gone. On top of this, the Duke of Norfolk and another one of his cronies in the court, the Bishop of Winchester, had been slowly whispering in the king's ears a lot of salacious uh, detail about Cromwell's desire to marry one of Henry's daughters, Mary Tudor. They'd been whispering that to the king, saying that Cromwell wanted to take the throne, he wanted to take power, he wanted to usurp the king by bumping him off and marrying his daughter. This clearly was going to anger an already paranoid king. So another aspect of Cromwell's fall from power was his own ambition. Ever since he'd become chief minister, and in fact before then, he'd always had an enormous ambition to succeed. And this had caused a lot of problems for Cromwell along the way. He'd made a lot of enemies in this sense. Because he was a commoner, he was low born. So all of the noble families and the noble men within the court hated this upstart being around them and winning the king's favour. But there's more detail to it than that. 
After the Duke of Norfolk had introduced the Act of Six Articles, putting a limit on the religious changes, Thomas Cromwell knew that his enemies were moving against him, but he wasn't going to take it lying down. So pretty soon after it, when he's got his strength back and he'd recovered from his illness, in 1540, he storms back into the Houses of Parliament and over a period of days and weeks, he introduces more and more changes uh, to the law, especially to taxation. His tax changes in 1540 eventually won lots of money for the crown. And when the crown coffers started filling up with the gold and the pennies and the silver from around the, the kingdom, Henry VIII was back on side again. Cromwell had managed to win the king back over by bringing him in more cash. Henry was overjoyed and he made Thomas Cromwell, just at the point when everybody thought he was finished, he made Thomas Cromwell the Earl of Essex. It's funny what can happen when you bring Henry VIII a few quid. That links us on perfectly to the final point and that is the personality of King Henry VIII himself. This is the K, the King's personality. Throughout the 1530s, it has to be remembered that Henry VIII was always a little bit hot and cold with Cromwell. Even though he'd made Cromwell the chief minister and he'd promoted him through the ranks, in public, people were often commenting on the way the king treated Cromwell. He was even seen on occasions to slap him about the head and to berate him, tell him off in front of the other courtiers. People found this rather humiliating at the time and Cromwell had a bit of a reputation for being the king's dog. He sort of slapped him around and told him what to do and Cromwell couldn't do anything about it. So there was a sense of disrespect between the king and Cromwell on occasions. Partly this was probably brought about by the fact, as I mentioned before, that Cromwell was a commoner, he was low born. And the king, as the highest noble in the kingdom, is ultimately going to have a certain kind of distance between himself and a minister who came from a lowly stock. He's not blue blooded, he's not nobility, and the king is never quite going to overcome that. So as I said at the start of this video, on the 28th of July, Thomas Cromwell was executed. And all of this had come about for these five reasons that we've just covered. Ultimately, the final decision was made because of the king's personality. He'd had enough of Thomas Cromwell, he'd distanced himself from him, and he'd been listening in court to the whispers and the rumours of the Duke of uh, Norfolk and the Bishop of Winchester, these people who told him that Cromwell was trying to take the crown, that Cromwell was trying to marry Mary Tudor, the king's daughter, and that there was a big scandal going on with Cromwell. Add on top of that, the fact that the pilgrimage of grace had happened, 60,000 people had protested the king and a religious change, and Cromwell had made that whole thing happen, he's not a happy man. Add on top of that, the fact that he'd had to marry Anne of Cleves, a woman that he didn't like, a woman that he never wanted to get married to, and that was Cromwell's fault. Add on to that the religious changes, the dissolution of the monasteries and so on, that yes, they'd made Henry rich, yes, they'd increased the royal lands, but they deeply offended Henry's faith as a man. All of these things came together in, uh, the, in July of 1540 and led finally to the downfall of Thomas Cromwell. So these are your key factors, uh, C-R-E-A-K, and it might be worthwhile writing them all down and keeping them somewhere safe for you to remember. Creek, the influence of the Cleves, the influence of religious factors, Cromwell's enemies, the ambition of Cromwell himself, rubbing people up the wrong way, and finally the personality of the king. And it's easy to remember, to remember because when something's starting to creak, it's starting to get unstable, it's starting to fall down. And this is what happened to Cromwell's career and his life in 1540. Hopefully this video was useful to you. To you. Uh, hopefully you got something out of it. If you did like it, uh, don't forget there's plenty of other videos on the channel, especially about the rise of Thomas Cromwell and Wolsey.